<laughs> Let's get cracking. So welcome everyone to this webinar, Pragma webinar uh, on the future trends in asset management, reviewing the near term practical implications. Uh, yeah, so, so well, what we really aimed at doing when we put this um, information piece together was to, to share with you information that I think most of you would have might have heard before, perhaps in a different context, but to really bring it all together and, and, and give it a real practical slog, things that we all should be thinking of, those of us that um, involved with asset management. And, you know, these things that we really need to be aware of and, and take note of and understand how that uh, has got an impact on ourselves and our business. So it's not, you know, looking too far into the future. It's, it's really on the, on the year and now and a couple of years, perhaps into the future. And we believe that these trends is shaping asset, the asset management environment. And in this panel today, we've got uh, Stefan Cornelius. He's a managing director from uh, Pragma's advisory and academy business. Myself, I'm Dirk Janse van Rensberg. I'm the managing director for Pragma's OnKey software solutions business. And then that young gentleman next to me in that photo is Mr. Stefan Swanepoel. He's the head of product development. And next to him, you know, our, our colleague, Mr. Daryl Aberdeen, partner consultant, and, and real expert in the field of asset management. And we'll be your, I'll be your host today, and we'll, through, throughout this presentation, you know, change seats and, and take you through what we have to share. Stefan, if we can move to the next slide. This is gonna be the framework that we're gonna to use to, to anchor our discussion today. So I'll, I'll kick it off with, uh, you know, discussing the changing context of asset management. I'll then hand over to Stefan to talk about the rise of the digital asset management. And he's going to take us through seven, seven um, trends that we need to look out for. He's going to hand in over to Stefan Cornelius, who's going to talk about emerging business models that's get affected by these trends. And we're going to round the discussion off with Daryl Aberdeen taking us through talent and learning and the trends focused ar around that, that part of asset management. So if we were to talk about the, the challenging contents, we tried to summarize it in this, this format. And, and sure, I think there's many things that we might have missed, but this is really just to set the scene. You know, we're coming into a post-pandemic um, phase. You know, the world is in turmoil. There's many changing parts. If we were to do an external view into all these factors that's affecting our lives and affecting our businesses, I'm sure we can have a a much longer um, session and webinar, but at least the ones that I think we all would be able to pick up are, are, are the ones that we try to formulate into these four streams. And first of all, the changes in the asset design. And if we look at those two first bullets, modularization of assets uh, and components uh, standardization, you know, machine builders really focusing on that and OEMs to see if you, you know, they can build the equipment in a more modular way. And furthermore, to try and design the machine up front so that it is built in a way that it's easily maintainable or more, more, more robust and it built in such a way that it will reduce downtime. So we see a big focus from machine builders and, and, and OEMs really putting that to, to the fore. And on top of that, with the emergence of IoT and, and uh, you know, sensors becoming more affordable and IoT technology becoming more affordable, the, the ability to then right up front build in sensors into equipment and also, I think one level deeper, building a level of intelligence on, on top of the equipment as well, with edge processing also becoming more affordable. So all of that works towards a more intelligent asset that is coming off the production line and that gets implemented into the field, into plants. Um, and with that, also the, the ability to become more, more autonomous, um, become less reliant on operators, ultimately getting to, to almost a no-touch operation mindset which all lends to a much more sophisticated asset base that we need to deal with. We shift our focus into the emerging, emerging maintenance strategies. You know, you know, if we extend the whole idea of modularization of the equipment, it brings with it the ability to, to, to introduce, you know, offline maintenance where you're really able to, you know, rip out a, a sub-assembly of, of the equipment, take it perhaps to, to a, a place somewhere where it can be restored to its original uh, uh, nature and, and brought back to the equipment and, and swapping out certain pieces of equipment that is really happening quite often and with that the decentralization of maintenance as well trying to 
you know, fix and repair equipment as close as possible to, to the equipment itself. And in doing that, seeing certain certain level of improvements and increases in productivity. Opportunity maintenance, I think that's been a, a, around for a while, but really trying to optimize the short windows of downtime that you have for maintenance and predictive maintenance. We all know predictive maintenance is uh, has been around for a while, but with the uh, you know sensor technology and AI technology really coming to the fore, your ability to be more predictive in your maintenance approach is certainly something that everyone needs to understand and see if it can add value to your business. And lastly, intelligent spare and resource distribution, you know, and, and that can even go to the point where you you know, manufacture perhaps even some of your own spare parts with you know technology like three D printers, etc. Impact of the green economy, we, we certainly seen from a European point of view, a big drive towards that the legislation driving that, uh, and it will remain a continued focus and drive, even in South African context, we're seeing also certain legislation being passed where people need to be able to comply and report on their emissions. Um, and I think something that we're also seeing is one level deeper where shareholders are using their, their funds and their investments to also drive certain behaviors where they're also expecting certain level of sustainable behavior from, from businesses. And obviously, maintenance and energy management has got a huge part to play in that. And if you go one level deeper into supply chain planning as well, ensuring that in, in the way we operate and, and manage asset management, that we also take that into consideration, how we plan. And from a supply chain point of view as well, you know, you know making intelligent decision making around that so that because eventually it, that needs to end up on uh, your CO2 uh, emission scorecard. And the same goes for your local content and recycling with the whole drive towards zero waste. And then lastly, and I think we've all seen it and felt it in our businesses, you know, the, the additional demands that's been placed on employee well-being. Uh, as I said, we, we've just emerged from this COVID pandemic, you know, and I think there's a lot of scar tissue still that remains in businesses that we need to deal with. Mental health is something, a, a challenge that we're sitting with. There's a lot of turmoil in the international environment also that's flowing through into businesses, that's putting businesses under pressure and ultimately employees. And, and, and mental health of employees is becoming critical. We didn't list it there, but you know, it goes together with the sc skills crunch as well. Um, with you know, the demand for certain specific skills is just, just on the increase. We're seeing this hybrid working models. Um, you know, and the us versus them challenge remains, not just within business and traditional maintenance and operations, but also across businesses where you and your, your partners needs to work together and it, it often creates a us versus them challenge. Relentless pace of change, businesses are forced to adapt, are forced to evolve, and ultimately that places additional uh, pressure on, on the employees that we need to manage and that we need to deal with. Um, and lastly, the focus on health and safety, that's something that from an asset management point of view, certainly also increase in ensuring uh, the well-being of employees. Obviously, COVID-19 has also put that to the, to the fore, that as an agenda point, but the general health and safety has always been important and will continue to be that so in, in asset management. So just setting the scene, creating a bit of context for our discussion now. So with, with the shared understanding of the, this is the changing context of asset management, we'll now roll over the discussion into these 17 trends that we've identified. And I'm going to hand over to Stefan Swanepoel to, to take us through it. But before Stefan kicks us off with, uh, with the discussion, I would just want to uh, Want you to, to take a ten, uh, take note of the Q and A section at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to post any questions in there, and during the course of the of the webinar, we'll try to answer these questions either just by typing a response, or we might, you know, just pause the webinar at that point and maybe just respond at that point. At the end of the webinar or tomorrow morning, you will receive a link to this webinar as well, and you're welcome to share that and uh, with some of your colleagues as well, those that could not attend. So at this point, I'll stop and I'll hand over to you, Stefan Swanepoel. Thank you, Dirk, and yeah, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about the um, technology side of uh, you know the trends that we're spotting in, in asset management as they're starting to evolve. And I think yeah, we'd be amiss if we don't start with the digital twin. There's been a lot of talk about it, you know, for quite a couple of years now since IBM coined the, the, the phrase. Um, and I think we've seen uh, a, a lot of growth in, in the understanding of what, what the digital 
Twin really means for us and, and, and how that can be utilized. Um, many applications in terms of uh, optimizing performance of your assets, uh, doing planning. Um, you know, these days they talk about these 4D models where you can actually um, in time see how the physical 3D world will change and how that uh, impact your planning, for instance, if you need to do big projects and assemblies, uh, make sure that uh, those, those assets fits through the gates, for instance, uh, that type of uh, application. But then also in many other areas, you know, where um, everything digital around assets, uh, you know, becoming relevant and combined in this digital twin that we can use for, for planning and forecasting and modeling and all those types of applications. I think what's also coming to, to the fore is that, um, and the realization that, you know, what we traditionally had in our CMMS and enterprise asset management systems is actually a very under important underbuild of the digital twin. You know, what your assets are that you've got in place, the components, the maintenance tasks, the, the work order history, the condition readings, all those uh, information play a part in the digital twin. Stephen, if you can move for us to the next slide, please. I think that lists a few of the, um, you know, typical components of the digital twin. So yeah, I think you know if we look at this, uh, you know, the design of the assets, uh, it, it's computer aided design. Where it's located, you spatially asset libraries, you know, the asset register, your maintenance tasks, your process and um, operational technology data from your SCADA and various other process monitoring technologies, your simulations, physics level models, uh, engineering technology. I must say, I had to go and look up that ET term with engineering technology data. Um, that type of information forms part of the digital twin. And if we think about it, these are all things that makes it possible then for us to model and to plan and to predict in terms of the future based on such a digital model. Um, enterprise and IT data, I think that speaks for itself. And then obviously also quite a big uh, you know, role to play in terms of safety, um, you know, allowing us to do safe work uh, planning and risk assessments at, at, you know, upfront. So a big, big focus there on. And then Stephen, if you can move to the next one, please. I think this is just um, you know a, a view on what the typical EMS system um, you know could play and, and the part it plays in the digital twin. I think if you look there on the left, typical information that goes into your uh, in, in the, into EMS in terms of equipment running hours, um, service contracts, SLAs, maintenance history, you know condition, location, criticality of your asset. Um, all these things in this type of use case for a digital twin plays a role in terms of what maintenance uh, recommendations would be made by such a digital twin. Um, and then it obviously needs to go through various filters in terms of making sure that the uh, uh, work orders that's proposed is accurate, ultimately scheduling those work orders and then you know, uh, getting to, to maintenance execution plans. So just, just one example of uh, how a digital twin is actually already put in place through a typical um, maintenance management system. Right, next slide, please, Diego. Um, yeah, so if we if we then start looking at um, you know all this digitization and more and more of our business processes is being you know run in a digital format, throwing away the paper, the, the books and the work orders in, in terms of paper format. Um, more and more our businesses get reliant on this, and with that comes obviously, obviously the opportunity for. Um, for cyber attacks, and I think we've all seen in the news and are aware of, you know, many cases where um, big companies have been seriously compromised by, you know, uh, you know, attacks on the digital systems. So as we move into this digital age, you know, we we would we would be at serious risk if we don't sufficiently consider this. Um, I think you would have also seen in the, in the recent past, you know, many smaller South African companies being attacked in this way. And in the past, we might have considered asset management and maintenance management data, maybe not as so critical, but with it now being digitized and uh, our business process is really day-to-day -day relying on it. Uh, I think a lot of us can imagine how serious the effect would be if uh, your work orders that on a day-to-day -day basis goes out on mobile devices can't, can't go anymore. It brings your whole maintenance operation to a standstill. So very important to take that into consideration but with it as well, it brings extra cost, extra effort. So it also needs to be considered in our, in our maintenance planning. Right, next slide, please, Stefan. Um, then, you know, as we talk about the digital twin, 
um, you know, and equipment automation becoming more and more prevalent and, um, you know, more organizations looking at uh, optimizing, you know, all aspects of, of maintenance in an operational sense. That also obviously implies and requires that we've got a good understanding of the condition of that equipment. You know, if we are going to rely on it to, to operate autonomously, we also need to understand how its health is so that we can use that information to plan and schedule when that equipment needs to take, be taken offline and maintained. So, you know, the, the whole move to a real-time understanding of, of condition data, uh, you know, becomes, becomes quite important in that. And, you know, through technology advances, as, as we all know, becoming more and more feasible as well, you know, to have that, that information at hand. Um, you know, technologies like edge processing and, uh, you know, all those type of uh, processes makes this obviously also more feasible. Um, and, and, and possible for us to use. And these things obviously also play, play a role into other maintenance process automations that we'll get into later. Step on the next slide, please. Yeah, then, you know, as we start talking about digital information and detecting condition, uh, work order history, transactions, all these digital information, you know, we all realize the huge volume of data being generated that these days much more than what we can process and humans can look at and sensibly extract value from through BI models and offline analytics, et cetera. And with the expectation to, to utilize that data in a real-time basis, um, you know, to make decisions and give, give guidance, um, you know, the, the, the fields of artificial intelligence, machine learning, those technologies becoming more and more critical uh, for us to really Get the benefit from all this data that we're collecting and i think on the upside um, as these technologies evolve um, the feasibility of using those in different processes and uh, uh, the ability to spin up and train and uh, utilize this also becoming more and more simple um, and and you know i think one realizes that uh, you know the leaders in in, in different industries um, really embracing this. If uh, if your organisation is, is, is not focusing on this yet, you know one can expect that there will be some competitor out there that is using this type of technology to really get deeper insights and connect all the dots between the different types of digital data to um, to get an advantage. Stefan, next slide, please. Um, then, yeah, I mean, we talked a lot about automation, digital data already. Um, that obviously leads into, you know, the, the, the whole area of maintenance planning, planning, scheduling, allocation, and execution of maintenance. In the past, uh, paper-based, lots of humans involved there. Um, as we move to automated assets and, you know, terms like dark factories or lights off factories coming into play where um, the expectation is for an uh, operation to run for extended periods without human intervention, um, this, these automated planning and, and, and maintenance execution processes obviously becomes, you know, more and more important. And we need to be able to rely on these to, um, yeah, to, to perform optimally. Obviously, here all, everything starts to become or come together as well. Machine learning, uh, condition monitoring, monitoring of our um, operational processes, all these things play, play a role in this automated planning. Uh, you know, and this is now looking at the heavy industries. Uh, if we start looking at, um, you know, organizations with large asset at bases being distributed over big areas, field service engineering coming into play, and, you know, you have to optimally schedule the sequence with, with which work is done. You know, there's, there's application for automated maintenance planning and scheduling. Um, if I look at a recent example, uh, you know, one of our clients, more in the facilities management uh, space, big um, hotel groups that need to schedule uh, and work have, have work allocated automatically to quite a big uh, technician base. Uh, you know, automated scheduling of those resources becoming quite critical because you can't always route those through a human to get the right people to go and do the work. So um, automated planning and execution of maintenance, definitely a serious trend that we're seeing more and more coming to the fore. 
and that um, is also becoming more feasible these days with uh, advances in technology. Right, Stefan, next slide, please. Um, yeah, then, then these these things are all linked. I mean, if we if we uh, looked at this in the past, um, you know, we would have looked at your computerized maintenance management, enterprise asset management in a silo, working with data, uh, you know, just relevant in terms of the asset and its maintenance plans, maybe the staff members that's associated with that. But um, the integration of, of all this information with the rest of the enterprise data in terms of availability of staff, production plans, um, you know, scheduling of resources, all those things uh, playing a role. And, you know, with, with the focus and, you know, advancements in specific best of breed systems for specific applications, um, you know, it becoming more and more critical as well then to have the right integration technologies in place to make sure that these best of breed systems can, um, can operate seamlessly and utilize data without having to duplicate data um, extensively. So um, very, very important in, in that sense as well, to make sure that we really um, share data effectively be between different systems and, and extract the value, maximum value from that. Right, Stefan, next slide, please. Um, yes, and then, you know, as we, uh, as we, as we move towards, um, you know, remote maintenance and having this digital twin in place now, um, there is more and more the opportunity to also virtualize the, the, the way we do maintenance. And, and this, this has, has a role to play in terms of training, you know, where we in the past would have had to expose people to, to hazardous environments for training purposes nowadays. It's possible to do that through, through um, virtual means. The ability to have augmented reality in play where you can overlay information for your artisan to, to be available at the place of work while having his hands free to do work still playing a role there. Um, you know, and then obviously a use case that's, that's often uh, mentioned and, and also becoming more and more um, you know, common practice the, the, the concept of remote assistance of, you know, having fewer experts uh, situated in, uh, you know, in, in, in remote locations where they can assist your artisan on the ground to actually do, do work and help fault find. Um, these things are all becoming much more feasible these days. And obviously, you know, and I think those that, that, that dabbled with this in the past uh, would have experienced the challenges with, um, poor connectivity and poor quality of video and those kind of things, which we all know is, you know, steadily becoming less of a problem as 5G technology becomes um, more prevalent. Um, I think the whole COVID period that we all went through, uh, driving companies to invest more in, in better connectivity, all these things makes it more and more feasible to have uh, this type of technology in place and maximize the, you know, the use of, of technology in this, in this area. Stefan, thank you. That's, I think that's all for the technology slides. Um, yeah, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you, Stefan. Dirk, I just want to check, are there any questions for Stefan Swanepoel um, that have been popping up that we need to deal with, or should we go straight into the next section? No, you're happy to continue, Stefan. Please continue. All right. So just a, a, an apology before I start. I don't ever pay attention to how I look on my own webcam, and I, okay, and I see I've got more chins than a Hong Kong phone book at the moment. So I apologize if, uh, if I've offended anybody, but you're going to have to deal with me on that one, I'm afraid. Okay, the next uh, number of trends really deal with some of the implications of the technology um, advancements that Stefan has described, but also deals with how we implement and change the way that we use the science of asset management across the different businesses that we, uh, that we serve as asset management professionals. So the first trend talks about value-based asset management. Now, value drivers um, as a means of, anal of analyzing, um, you know, the, the way that costs and revenues change over the value chain of a specific business have been around for a long time. But traditionally in the asset management space, you know, it's been more about cost than anything else. You know, people want to talk about life cycle costing. They want to talk about, you know, optimizing the cost allocation to asset management. But we're seeing more and more um, companies using almost real-time analysis of equipment availability and also the cost um, and reliability information to be able to allocate resources in uh, value chains across their production lines 
to change production outcomes as the business value change change. So you know, it, it, rather than becoming a reactive cost center, the asset management team can now become almost a, a partner to the business to say, if we need to change production volumes due to market responses, we have the ability to look at our equipment suite. We know where to allocate resources in terms of either operations or maintenance um, resources to be able to change production output, change equipment availability, um, potentially change you know, batch scheduling and those types of things to really impact the value drivers of the business as a whole. Um, and so it's about value-based management more than about the cost um, and, and being able to apply some of those technologies that Stefan uh, referred to earlier to really understand on a real-time basis how my equipment is performing. And if I then have the models around reliability and production um, output, I can start partnering with the business around you know, changing um, allocation to certain production lines and really getting the income statement level of the business performing in a different way. The second trend um, is about, it has to do with uh, ROI based business models. Now we, we're seeing um, the emergence of specifically original equipment manufacturers offering return based guarantees or performance guarantees to their customers. It's a competitive market. And so rather than saying, you know, this is a traditional asset sale transaction, um, OEMs are now saying to clients, I will guarantee a certain level of return or a certain level of performance associated with that piece of equipment. Obviously, that is a very different financial and risk model. And very often we see that insurance providers are also partnering with OEMs to be able to, to diversify the risk in, inside their portfolio. But the, the interesting um, reality around ROI-based business models is that it needs a very different set of technical capabilities for a asset uh, OEM to be able to offer those to clients. Because you need to have a very advanced set of predictive analytics, asset health monitoring, and logistics planning skills to be able to not lose money hand over fist. If you're going to guarantee a certain ROI, then obviously you need very close view on what the machine is doing, um, you know, how is it performing? How do I predict potential failures or issues with the machine performance? And how do we then structure a logistic solution that's able to, to deal with, you know, spares and, and skills allocation to that piece of equipment should it become an issue? Um, so it's an interesting um, commercial model associated with, um, with offering these types of contracts, but certainly has a significant implication in the asset management skills that an organization that wants to do this needs. The next um, trend is about structuring the asset management capability within your own business um, in order to meet the organization requirements in the most effective way. Now, traditionally, uh, uh, asset management teams have been structured on a sort of an ideal pyramid or a headcount model where you know, people are saying, if I have so many machines, I need so many artisans, I need so many foremen, I need so many planners, you know, I need an engineering manager, et cetera, et cetera. And so we go up the food chain. But the reality we're seeing in the market at the moment is that the nuances associated with choosing which skills to put where is becoming a lot more sophisticated. Um, it's no longer just a question of selecting a you know, cookie cutter approach and trying to recruit people because the skills are scarce. And as people uh, diversify their sites across different markets, uh, different geographies, and also the type of assets they have in place, have a fundamental uh, impact on how they choose different skills and also where they put them. So there's a, a, a very interesting um, approach that we've used to look at, you know, which assets you have, how complicated they are, where are they, what is your corporate operating model, and then designing a structure to, to fit into that model and still meet the asset management requirements of the, the asset base that's out there. Um, as an example, you know, there's two sort of structures that came out of, of design work recently. The top one is a uh, client in the food packaging industry where that they have a very diversified manufacturing operation. They they do everything from you know, a canning to to paper products, uh, and so what they've chosen to do is have a reliability engineering team that looks after every fleet of equipment uh, independently, um, but have a central asset care group that sets standards, benchmarking, performance KPIs on behalf of the entire group, and then a planning office that looks at. Um, site-based planning and allocation of skills and resources and specifically spares across those different production operations. So while the technicians and the artisans will stay at the, the you know, the frontline staff will stay at site, um, they've ch chosen to create a central asset care group that sets policy and standards. 
and a reliability engineering team that looks at the assets per fleet. Um, the bottom one is a, is a different scenario. It's a mining client. There, their assets are much more homogeneous, um, but they are quite widely dispersed over a, a wide area. Um, you know, geographically, they're far apart. And so what they've chosen to do is have an execution manager at every site that has a maintenance engineer and coordinator and does all the, the coordination of the artisans and technicians. But they've centralized their reliability team um, and their planning team in one location at their head office that's able to guide and direct resources to the different sites and site uh, supervision happens on a site by site basis. So it's just an interesting variation in terms of how thinking through what your organization needs to be successful allows you to structure an asset management team that, that supports that um, effectively. Um, the next example here talks about um, an increased focus on maintenance readiness. Uh, for those of you who have been around the capital projects environment for a long time know that we've had some very significant high profile failures in terms of timeline budget and operability in the capital environment, not only in South Africa, but also across the rest of the world. And as a result, we're seeing that asset owners are focusing much more on maintenance readiness much earlier in the process. So rather than relying on a design team that may not have the right operational and maintenance skill sets to, to think through these value chains properly, they're now involving reliability engineers and even planning resources much earlier in the process to think through not only you know, the maintenance readiness to make sure that the spares and skills availability and, and the, the maintenance plans are in place before commissioning, uh, but also in many cases influencing the actual design of the equipment based on decisions that, and trade-offs that have to be made uh, during the design process. Um, I can show you another example here. This is for a mining client. Um, there's two different sites here. The one is a, um, a copper smelter and the other one is a base metals refinery. Um, and these plants haven't been built yet. Um, the, well, the, the uh, copper refinery has been built yet, but the extension, the modification, the construction hasn't started yet. Um, and what you see on the left hand side of the screen, there are the PNID, you know, the 3D models and that come from the PNID diagrams of these plants. Um, and so our teams are busy developing maintenance plans, reliability models, um, spares lists, um, availability simulations, and a lot of related work while the design work is happening. So that when the plant actually starts construction, um, the operations and maintenance component of the, the plant is much more well prepared to start with commissioning activities once the commissioning cycle starts. So there you can see the type of, of work done there. Uh, so reliability models, failure mode modeling, uh, availability simulations, and then you know, a lot of criticality analysis and tactics development that supports that, uh, that operational readiness process. The, the next one, uh, and I think Stefan referred to it a bit when he spoke about some of the technologies. Um, you know, we are in extreme, you know, extremely dependent on technology and the application of digital processes in our asset management space at the moment. Um, and the, the world of building everything yourself, I think, has left us forever. Um, you know, we come from a world historically where um, you know, systems engineers have built a fit for purpose system for every plant um, or for every collection of plants. Uh, but the reality is if you start operating in a world where you have to operate in many different geographies, um, you have to operate a very wide diversity of equipment, your ability to do it all yourself uh, to the extent where it's necessary is almost, it's almost impossible to do so. And so we're seeing a lot of clients building technology and, and service ecosystems where they choose one or two best practice partners and they use them for their global operations. So whether it's a technology suite, you know, so Stefan spoke a lot about the edge to cloud world. Um, there's a lot of things that, that form, inform that technology stacks. Um, and the same is true of service providers, you know, whether it's somebody who provides a very specific um, reliability engineering or, um, or even maintenance service uh, to that asset base contracting in ecosystems and saying, you know, I, I trust these partners, we work together, um, our commercial models are consistent and we're able to provide a service to our asset base, doesn't matter where it is in the world. It's a much more reliable way of doing it. In some cases, it's a bit more expensive, but building that reliable ecosystem gives much more predictable results, especially in a growing business where new plants are being built in geographies where we may not necessarily be comfortable operating based on historical allocation. 
And then the last one in the business model um, is about the customer demand for responsible maintenance. Initially, uh, Derek mentioned it earlier in some of the, of the setup, um, you know, we come from a world where, you know, carbon footprint reporting um, is, it was sort of critical to everybody's sustainability agenda. But I think we've moved significantly beyond that. Um, we're seeing a lot of activism from both um, customers um, and corporate and investors for clients to be much more transparent in terms of how the choices they make around production and maintenance activity support a zero waste or a environmentally responsible agenda. And that equation becomes exponentially more complicated when you think about the supply chain disruptions that are currently um, prevalent in our world. Um, and clients are demanding that things like packaging, um, the choices of where specific spares and materials are being sourced from, the recyclability of certain um, materials, and also sort of the end-to-end cradle-to-grave um, maintenance environment and asset disposal is becoming much more, we have to be transparent and people are choosing, uh, customers are making consumer-based choices based on what customers are, or clients are able to offer them and, be, uh, and, and, and report on in this space. So everything from conversion to solar energy, reduction of carbon-based fuel, use things like um, optimizing um, maintenance, work planning, and route optimization of crews. Those are all things that are starting to play a much more prevalent role in terms of the overall environmental impact that our maintenance activities have. Um, and it's certainly in, in, in Africa, I think we're slightly behind, but in, in Western Europe and North America, there's a lot of pressure on companies to provide very transparent and responsible reporting in this space. And that's something that we think is only going to increase going forward. So that's it from an emerging business models perspective. I think the last three belong to Daryl and Daryl. Uh, Dirk, unless there are any questions that you want sure. us to deal with. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a fascinating question coming from Frank Klomp uh, from Optimize My Day. I met Frank in Dusseldorf a couple of years ago. So thanks, Frank, for, for diving into this webinar. Nice talking to you again. And he's got the question, with regards to your asset collaboration platform, how can third parties hook up with that platform and provide planning and optimization services algorithm, algorithms to participating organizations? So I guess uh, both Stefans, I guess, if you can both take a turn and trying to answer that one. So it really speaks, I guess, to the, to the ecosystem play, but it's certainly got a, got a technology component to that as well. Um, I don't know which one wants to go first. Look, I think the, uh, let me let me admit and say, you know, from a collaboration platform, mm -hmm. Stefan Swanepoel is probably in a better position to answer. So, Stefan, maybe you want to go first and, and I'll try and see if I can augment later. Yeah, that's good, Stefan. Thank you. Look, I think in terms of a collaboration platform, that's a that's a concept that um, that's been forming in the industry for a while now. And in, in that in that aspect, um, if, you, if you look at how uh, uh, enterprise asset management system like Brahma's Anki system is, is used already by some big enterprises. It's, it is already such a collaboration platform where central business uh, units would develop maintenance plans and there's recommendations coming into, into that platform from the different regions or different um, asset owners in the, in the client base that wants to collaborate and ask for changes in the platform. So that comes more through normal ticketing systems and through help desk services, et cetera, into the platform. Um, what, we, what we've got in mind in the deeper future for, um, for a collaboration platform is, you know, speaking to the point that Stefan Cornelis also raised in terms of platform business and ecosystems, is that around such a platform, uh, your asset um, creator, the OEM, the asset owner, the service providers, the uh, specialized consultants can all play a role in, you know, for example, create maintenance plans, keep that updated, uh, know which service providers are available to work on the, on the particular asset, uh, you know, highlight obsolescence of components. Those are the kind of things that we've got in mind. Not all of that in place yet in the collaboration platform though. Stephen, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think the only thing I want to add to that is that that I think the commercial model on on the on the non-technology part of it um, still needs some work. You know, we've been ha having this dream about subscription services for certain value-added elements like the algorithms that that was mentioned. I'm not aware of any 
a live example where the actual commercial feasibility of it has been tested yet. Um, I, I think, you know, like any platform, scale is key. Um, and it's going, it needs to get to a point where, um, you know, I always use the example of bearings, you know, that we have more bearings in the database than SKF has. Otherwise, it's going to be of limited use to, to the users of that asset. Um, you know, how we then segment up the service providers that have very specific value added components and how that subscription model would work for the asset owners. I think we still got a few things to learn there. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's new, it's emerging for us. I think on the technology side, it's clearer. You know, in terms of how, if you look at that edge to cloud stack that we've built, for example, that commercial model is clear and we, you know, we, we might not like it always, but we certainly know how it works. But on the, you know, if you get into a real collaboration platform basis, I think that that commercial model and how that will, how that will allocate value to specific participants is still under development. It's not something that I have a, a you know, good example of where it's worked well in the past. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but Frank, you, we're certainly welcome to have a you know, offline conversation with myself and Stephen Swan as well if you want to continue. Yeah, maybe just to, add, to add to that, I think that's definitely something, Frank, that we'd, we'd be welcome to, to discuss with you in detail further you know, to highlight what's exactly the case at the moment. I think this is uh, the, a good time to then hand over to Daryl Aberdeen to take us through the last couple of trends um, around talent and learning. Over to you, Daryl. Thank you very, very much, Dirk. Um, I um, was fortunate that the very first question that came in, and those of you who perhaps might not be following it, go into the question and answer and go and look at the answer tab in the question. There was a very interesting question that came from Ernest Stone Street all the way from Katu, talking about how do we take the people with us? Technology is changing as fast as faster than what people can accommodate that change. I, in some ways, yes, Ernest. Um, in other ways, I think I've lived through enough um, real fundamental technology change, the internet. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember when we still went around in donkey cars and we moved to the internal combustion engine, um, that people are amazingly ad able to adapt to the change. I think um, a lot of the predictions that are made here, and I'm going to make some predictions, um, are... <laughs> Yeah, they are a little bit pie in the sky. Um, some of them might happen. Um, some of them, in fact, probably they will happen. It's just when they're going to happen. Bill Gates said in his book, when he wrote a book, when he was still the, the, the guru, something about we underestimate, sorry, we overestimate the change that can happen in five years, but in 10 years, we underestimate it. And it's quite amazing when the internet first started, we thought this, you know, in five years after the internet yeah, what, what use is this? 10 years later, all of us were on the internet. So um, the changes are happening. The timing of that change is going to be, um, I, I think is going to be um, very difficult to predict. Um, I do suspect that we are going to get trigger events which are going to force us to make changes. COVID was one of them. All of a sudden, everyone started Zooming. All of, one, all of a sudden, a lot of other things happened. The delivery of, um, from um, the, the supermarkets, it just took off. It never happened before. And all of a sudden, that new technology and everything I read with it just happened. So I'm going to make some predictions. I'm going to write things down. I'm going to, and I'll probably be wrong. But um, I think it's more the timing than the actual change. Um, one of the things that technology is going to do for us um, is... It's going to make it easier for less skilled people to do their job. So um, let's, uh, uh, less skilled is perhaps not the right word, but let's take the example of the way um, we used to fly commercial airplanes. There were always two pilots and there was a flight engineer sitting in the back looking after the engines. The technology, the digital dashboards and all of the things, heads up displays, I don't know, all those fancy words that they used enabled that job of flight engineer to be done by the the pilot because it made it easy for him it put the controls in front of him in a dashboard on a screen and it made it easier easier for them to be able to do two people's work in one and i think that's going to be one of the trends we're going to have here so the the first one which is similar to that is um we have tradespersons tradies as the australians call them artisans as some people call them 
They trained in very con conventional ways, um, how to align a coupling, um, stuff that um, yeah, might not be so relevant anymore. They are going to this, the move towards a much more predictive maintenance approach. Um, talked about earlier by, by some of my colleagues is definitely that the sensors are out there. It's going to cause, it's just going to enable much, a much more predictive manner. It's going to cause these people not to walk around with spanners, but to walk around with vibration meters, uh, ultrasound testers, infrared cameras. They are going to be walking condition monitoring execution type people that's going to be their role so the question is then what happens to the condition monitoring team are they the are they the flight engineers um that we went previously that we we are you know, of the previous generation or do condition monitoring people provide us with that interpretation which maybe um an an, uh, an artisan might not be able to do the more complex cases and of course, we are going to find that um, we have artificial intelligence being able to interpret multiple signals, condition-based signals coming back from our equipment, multiple sensors, multiple streams of data, and saying, ignore that one, but that one is important. React to that one. Um, and that's also starting to come. So we're going to find that um, tradespersons are going to be sitting in a control room much more, looking at at screens rather than walking around the plant. Um, in fact, um, the, it's already started where we find a lot of places have two separate control rooms, a condition monitoring control room is not really control, but screens on the wall, and then the traditional operating control room. Um, one of the other areas and is also touched upon by my colleagues, um, planners and schedulers, and now planning in particular, I'm not quite sure that that role is ever going to disappear quite so easily. Um, but the scheduling aspect is just heavily data dependent. We had an environment previously where the reason we plan or the reason we schedule in weekly chunks is we couldn't get information quick enough back from the execution staff into the system that we could react to it. So by the time we got the paperwork order back, um, it was already the next week and only then could we plan the next cycle. So um, real time planning or dynamic allocation, it's got various words in various places is going to be in the next way we can get that information back almost instantaneously through tablets through sensors to geolocation of where the artisans will know who's available instantaneously and we can do that dynamic allocation. Um, someone like Amazon does this with their delivery teams. Um, we'll be able to schedule like Amazon on a factory. Um, as soon as a team, as, as soon as a person has the deliveries happened and a delivery truck is now um, available for the next delivery, the scheduling software will kick in and tell us where th that person is needed next. So um, they, these are definitely changes coming, require a completely different skill set um, from um, the, the, the current skill set. And I think perhaps to try and answer um, Ernest's question um, is perhaps we are going to recruit and train and manage by flexibility rather than skills. So the ability to be flexible and to adapt is going to be more important than a particular skill. The ability to learn new things is going to be one of the success criteria for getting a job in the new environment. Perhaps lastly on this slide, and I spent a lot of time on this slide, um, is um, all of these new technologies and processes to support them creates a new breed of assets. We've all of a sudden got phones that have got WhatsApp on them um, with Wi-Fi all over the place. Um, um, talking about additive manufacturing, 3D printing that someone mentioned early. Well, now we've got a 3D printer someone. Someone's got to maintain that 3D printer so that we can print our spare parts. So, um, and those, those assets need maintenance, need, need to be maintained in exactly the same way and um, now become part of our, our, of our tools. So how do we go about transitioning our people from the old way of working to the new way? And if you could go to the next slide, please, Stefan. So, um, yeah, the, the, the learning approaches, and I think we, we have a lot to learn about the learning approaches, but um, there's a lot coming out of 
the just the ecosystem. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. There's a, a lady called Sabina, um, and she's an, a, 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 a particle physicist. And I follow her on YouTube, and I learn about particle physics because I didn't learn about it at university. I, I learn about it from, from her. And it's all done through webinars, through TikTok type um, learning interactions. Um, and I really enjoy it, and I learn well like that. Um, you speak to any of the, the software people, and where did you learn that? Why well, I Googled it. That's how I figured out how this works. I Googled the, the, the algorithm you need to sort a, a list from biggest to smallest. There's 20 solutions on the internet. I picked the best one. They just Google as their friends. So this ability to, to learn in a different way and the ability to teach in a different way. And I think we've got, we've got as teachers, as, as custodians of knowledge that want to impart it, have got a lot to learn about doing this in a more effective way. Um, the old methodology, the sage on the stage, as they say, is definitely something that um, is not going to um, belong in the, in the new generation. Um, millennials, um, are in, millennials are inherently curious um, so these new learning styles, I think we've just got to figure out the match between the way they learn and um, the way, um, yeah, the, what, what we need to teach them. There's a lot of good ways out there. The ecosystems are just developing through, just developing on, on TikTok, on YouTube, are just developing themselves. We can almost just watch the evolution there and copy it. Right, um, and, and perhaps I just want to, to say um, again to Ernestine, I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk on the last slide, thanks Stefan, is um, our um, artisan training syllabus is woefully outdated. Um, we are teaching, yeah, we're we teaching certain things for a start, I don't know if 18 months or whatever uh, um, uh, an electrician goes through is enough, but we're not teaching them the right things. There's a lot of things that they should be learning as part of their basic, just, I mean, learning defect elimination or learning how to do a proper root cause analysis is not part of their training. I believe it should be. And I mean, that, this is not high tech. This is 15 years old stuff when we talk about RCA, and yet we're not teaching our, 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 our tradies the ability to, to look for a defect and find a way of, of resolving it. So... Um, the syllabus, and that's a difficult one to change because we've got to change government institutions, um, SACWA, there's, there's a bunch of bodies that we do that. But I think between the people in this room and the companies in this room, um, there's enough momentum to say we've got to start moving on to a better way of doing it. Right, thank you. And the reliability engineer, perhaps this one is also... Um, I talked about tradespersons and planners who tend to be much more at an operational level, um, at, at one level up the university degree type person, um, um, reliability engineer. So I think the first thing is five years ago, if you asked just about any of our major mining houses, how many reliability engineers do you have? They would say, we've got a couple, but this is just, you know, we, we use them as part of the career development. You know, it's it's, um, it's the, the way up through the organization. Spend a tour of duty in reliability for a year, get to know the ropes and we'll promote you, get your government ticket and then you can become, you know, you can become a manager after that one. And that, that's, that's the way up. Um, now, reliability engineering in, in a very short time. I've been, I've been watching this change happening um, at like in a blink of an eye. If you go to any mine now, you'll find 20 reliability engineers. It's a a profession, it's people are there because they want to be there. This is what they do, and they hopefully are doing it mostly well. So um, the, the, the idea of the reliability engineer post just to be, a, you know, put, put your, your bright person there so they can learn the ropes is definitely changing. The second thing is the skills of the reliability engineer is changing as well. Um, I've got many friends who, um, engineers, and guess where they ended up working? They ended up working for one of the banks. I've got a, a, a good friend who's the CFO of one of the major banks here. He was an engineering geologist and specialized in computational engineering geology, figuring out how numbers, you could predict the behavior of rocks by using big numbers. And he's the CFO of one of our 
our, our local banks here because it's numbers. He could take data, manipulate data, and make predictions in the financial sector. It's important. You want to know where the stock price is going, and he could do that. Um, a lot of my colleagues have gone into banking. Um, we are assets. If you look at um, Standard Bank, not Standard Bank, if you look at um, the, 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 the supermarkets, also begins with an S, um, we are assets in their life. We are sources of value. We have a, a smart shopper card. We are an asset. We are a stream of revenue for them. They are analyzing our behavior. Uh, Google does it terribly, uh, wonderfully. Uh, you know, our behavior and maximizing their return from us as assets. So that's where reliability is going to go to. Um, being able to take vast amounts of data coming from all of these super cheap sensors, being able to make sense of it, put it into, um, and be able to predict the trends, be able to extract value from that in terms of reliability is going to be their, their new role. So those courses that they did in statistics where they said, ah, oh, we have to do statistics, but I know we're never going to use it again. I'm going to just pass the course, scrape by with 50. That's not going to be enough. Those numerical methods that we um, might have hated when we were at university are going to be our, the reliability engineers, bread and butter. Yeah, so those are some of the changes that are coming to the people. Thank you. I think I'm done. I'm going to hand back to Dirk. Fascinating. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. Real, um, real entertaining way for, and, and great examples that you've used there in explaining those last couple of trends. Yeah, so I think we've come to the end of this webinar. I don't think it's going to make sense to, to pick up more, more questions here towards the end. I think our intention was to end... Um, at half past and we pretty much there. So I just want to thank everyone for attending. I hope this was insightful. Like I said in the beginning, you know, the, the intent was not to paint a picture of what the world would look like in 10 years. It's more the emerging trends that you really need to take note of and it's really going to impact your lives in the, in, in, in the near future. And it's, I still believe in listening to my colleagues here and the way they've explained it, that that's a very true prediction and a very accurate list of trends that we all need to be aware of. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Daryl, Stefan and Stefan your preparations. Yeah, and I hope to uh, see you all again in the near future in one of our other webinars. Keep well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.